Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Good evening, everyone. This is episode 186 of The Team House. I'm Jack Murphy. Dave's out at a cybersecurity conference tonight. And it'll just be me and Larry talking tonight. Our guest, Larry Chambers, is the author of Recondo and Death in Ashaw Valley. He is a former Warp Ranger, served in the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrols in Vietnam. Uh, one of his teammates was a former guest of the show, Ken Miller. I uh, hope you guys will check that interview out after this one. Um, also served with Gary Linderer, uh, a, a, you know, a kind of a, your peer group that wrote uh, a lot about the Warps after the war and people like me read mm. those books, uh, mm. you know, in the 1990s as kids. And uh, it was, I certainly found them inspirational. So, I mean, this is really like a special moment for me, Larry, and I, I really mm. appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Well, you're welcome. No, it's exciting. So, Larry, uh, I'd like to start off talking about, you know, your origin story and sort of like how you grew up and what your pathway was that, that eventually took you towards the military. Well, I always, I grew up in the military. I knew I was going to be in the military. There, every childhood picture of me is in, is in a uniform, my dad's little cut down officer's uniform. And so and I, we lived on uh, a, 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 an army base called Fort Berry, you know, Fort Cronkite on the San Francisco coast was a missile battery. And so that was, you know, in the um, mid fifties. And so I kind of remember the, the old brown boot army because it wasn't that long after korea and my dad served in korea served in world war ii and he got kind of a choice assignment after the war and so all these so my friends growing up were privates and corporals that worked under my dad he ran the the radar um site on the bay on the fort and so i mean my dream was to be uh was to go to West Point. My dream was to, then it became, my dream was to, I wanted to be a, a, a fighter pilot. And I took the um, Marine Corps. I remember I, when I went down to take the Marine Corps um, flight test the, and flunked it. I got such a low score. They didn't even tell me what the score was. It was so bad. I was so nervous because I wanted it so bad. I literally would go blank. I would, you know, I was one of those kids that I'd take a test and I'd have to read one question 15 times, you know, um, does the plane take off uh, in the air? I don't know. I mean, I was just, it was terrible. So I was, I was, let's say for the last couple of years of high school, I was just so, I thought, oh man, I'll never, I'm never going to get my dream come true. And then I found out I could volunteer for the draft. I mean, this is opposite from the, all of the stories you hear about. <laughs> oh, I was drafted. I get, I was like, when I got my draft notes, we were like, yeah, it was like, oh my God, you know, it was weird. Um, but that I, I loved the army. I loved being in the army. I, I was, um, my friendships are still lifelong friendships with guys like Miller and Linder and, and Looney and Burford and all of these guys over the years. And we all, you know, as soon as one guy dies, everybody, <laughs> no, oh no, you know, we're getting closer, but just, lifelong friendships i've never found you know i would use my ranger service in that when i was in business to shame people be like if somebody stood me up or was late like 20 minutes i said great you just got my whole team killed what are you talking about and they go well as far as i'm concerned if you're late you're dead if the chopper comes in and you're doing they go like what talking about it's, it's, nobody had that kind of i was a stockbroker i worked for ef hutton at after i graduated from university of utah and and i i sort of had to tone that down you know i sort right, of kept right. the whole i'm a because they used to think if you went to vietnam you were crazy and there was all these guys that had never gone to vietnam that were crazy and they were and they made, gave such a bad rap for the guys but and i would hear these stories and i go like that's not the story that I remember. I mean, I remember guys tearing each other apart to get on the helicopter to go out to rescue people and, you know, our teams. And and um, we never left anybody behind. And guys would, you know, 
take a bullet for it. I mean, it was everything that you see in, in the Avenger stories, but were true. You know, these guys were heroes and I was just lucky to be, you know, I always felt like I was like the, like the, like the, I just felt I was lucky to be there. I just, you know, I, n I never put myself up to to think I was anything um, at, at the time. I just, I was really good at being alert. I was good at being a point man. That's, I used to say, I went from the, I had dyslexia. I mean, I still have dyslexia, you know, which made school, and I was ADD or still, I guess I am. So it made school really, really difficult for me. And I, I, I remember going into going in the army. It was like I moved to the head of the class. Mm. You know, I just I mean, the, the training was was like a piece of cake. I thought it was like, you know, somebody had sent me to camp. It was like <laughs> fun, like fun camp. <laughs> and I get to Vietnam and it was even more fun. And they had, you know, all the rounds. They gave you all the ammunition and targets were everywhere. So it was like, oh, my gosh, what, you know, but I couldn't tell this, you know, I come back and try to yeah yeah tell people you know like they don't get it the very i don't know if you ever heard of a, a ranger named uh cox and he he was this guy and i just talked to his wife he just died uh two years ago and every time he see me he would like give me a he would punch me in the shoulder it was just he just loved to punch me he was just like one of these big guys and i got to where i just let him punch me so one time, I mean, he was on that mission that you may remember uh, that Gary Linder wrote about, um, uh, um, where the whole team got wiped out. By that, guys, that huge Claymore or something. A huge, know. yeah, huge uh, NBA Claymore. And I was on the other team. So I was out too, but we were close enough we could hear him, but far enough where we couldn't get to him. And Cox got his, got blown, his, his, um, his arm, like his hand was blown back and his stomach was blown open. He like set his own arm and taped it to his shotgun, taped himself up and was there for the next five hours shooting guys coming up the hill. And you're like, I told that when I was at a, at a party at, at a college party in like 1970, after I came back and there was a guy and he was holding court and he was talking about, you know, he plays rugby, and I'll tell you what, that's a goddamn tough sport, that rugby. I'll tell you, I sprained this ankle. I played the whole game with a sprained ankle and a tooth broken. And I went like, wow, I, you know, I had a friend that got a sprained ankle too, but he also got his stomach blown up and his hand was blown. You know, I start telling this story, and people would be like, uh, <laughs> in shock. You know, it was just a little bit too real, Yeah, that yeah, whole yeah. war, you know. But before, you know, Larry, before moving on, I just want to take a moment to ask you about your dad, because he was an Alamo scout, which was like very unique unit um, that Rangers yeah. trace their lineage back to. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about his experiences and, and kind of like what you grew up around. Well, he was also a functional alcoholic, so he was, <laughs> you know, he could handle the job, but, you know, mostly he was an alcoholic. So... Um, he never ever talked to me about any of that stuff, but really? I, that's always I'd heard that he was part of. The, he was in the Philippines. He was wounded in Leyte, and um, you know the uh, it came back. I guess I mean then they had me after after he you know was sent back home. But so I don't know a lot about. Well, I I do know this one story, but this is speculation. But he's dead, so there's nothing he can do to me right now. Um, he was a young lieutenant, and I've got a picture of him in his, um, he's a brand new second lieutenant uh, out of high school, and he's at a, a Thanksgiving dinner, and it's 1941, Thanksgiving. So it's like two weeks or something before the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. And I've got a picture of him. You know, these guys have no idea what's going, what's coming down the horn. So he goes, they, they go and they train in the Philippines and they did all of that. And um, I'd heard that uh, he, and like, a, nah, I shouldn't even tell it. Well, now I've started, I got to tell the story, but um, there was like a machine gun nest and he took us 
you know, he's a platoon, he's a platoon leader, right? So he takes his platoon and a whole bunch of the guys get shot. And he came, they finally came back and a lot of his guys got shot and they busted him for it. Oh, because wow. Because he got, he lost so many guys and he sort of never got over. I mean, he never, ever talked about that. I heard that from like a half brother of mine that told me that story. So I can't say it's true, but it, it sort of fit. But Yeah. It makes sense uh, why he wouldn't want to talk about it too much. But I remember, you know, I remember him as, um, a sergeant first class on this fort on Fort Berry and how strike everything was and how, you know, his, his, his fatigues were like crackled. They were just crisp and the boots were always shined and everything. And I just grew up with that. And I, you know, so when I got to Vietnam, it was a shock. It was like, I grew up in one army and then there was a gap, you know, from the fifties and then the six, I go in 68 and I'd go into a whole new army that I did not recognize. You know, they didn't, a lot of the guys did not have the respect. I mean, not in our unit, but in other units, you know, didn't have respect for the the guys above them and all that stuff. It, would, it just did change. It was, and of course that war was a lot different, right. you know, than, right. other, than other wars. So and if you were drafted. So you, uh, you happily accepted your drafting and uh, joined the army and uh, you're, you're infantry, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and then uh, let's let's kind of like fast when, forward to the part where you arrive in Vietnam and, and how you get yourself on a work team. OK, but I was infantry, but I went to jump school at, after infantry you know, training, you know, so I've got the pop pop mm -hmm. 11, 11 Fox, pop -pop, whatever that is. Um, and so what, when I arrived in Vietnam, is that what you. Yeah. Yeah. Me? When you got there and, and volunteered to be a work, I mean, could you walk us through some of that? Oh, yeah. Um, um, like I said, I wanted to do all these really cool things that I couldn't test out to do. So I get there and I, you know, to me, special forces, I don't can't believe that people don't equate this in Vietnam, but I sure do. They were like gods, literally walking gods. If you were an SF, you were the coolest thing on the planet Earth. And um, but it was a four year six-year commitment to do that and i and what i what i found out by volunteer for lips i could do and you know i could uh what 1049 or whatever that was into fob like into an fob1 or something if you wanted to so there's a way to get into sf and not you know we didn't i don't know if they had the q course back then or any of that stuff but i was a bunch of these um paratroopers that had got there and they sort of um um they didn't sort of they sort well they were counting guys off and they counted off and this was 1968 and this was we had lost a thousand guys in the 101st up in the north and and so the 101st wasn't exactly everybody's choice you know when they get there but they counted off and i remember they draw like a couple in front of me and you guys are all 101st and i jumped up and yelled is excitement because that was my dream come true i had it all mapped out in my mind i'd be 101st and i'd volunteer to do something really cool so and i do that and everybody was you know a lot of these guys thought i was like nuts for for for, for that for that show of emotion and then um we there would be a guy that would come by and um they would this this young sergeant uh, uh gave us a a talk about being alert, what it meant to be alert. And he, he said something that I would never forget. And it was, look, when you're out, you got five, six guys. The And I hate to use this word, but I got to say it goop because it's a word that was takes used me at back. The time. Yeah. It was used at the time. It's very, you know, I would never use it now, but, um, um, be, be, shoot, that made me lose my trend of thought about, Oh, so here's what, so he goes, you're out in the in the in the jungle, and the, and the gooks don't they they can't see you. You can't see them. You're out there trying to find them. He says, "Look, it's some of you guys are going to go north, and you're going to be on a fire base. You're going to be an infantry company, and you can hear an infantry company all the way to Hanoi. They make so much noise. But lerps were silent. He told us the whole story. He goes, it's safer behind the lines than it is in front of them. And I'm like, boom, my hand went up <laughs> and volunteered, and. Uh, people thought I was crazy when I did that, but I, I really think it sa that saved my life. It just being in that LERP company, though it was hard. I mean, it wasn't, you know, a, a 
cakewalk. But, but you were, was, you were around um, motivated, competent people. Everybody there was, they were all volunteers twice mm -hmm. when we were still on jump status. So, um, you know, the 101st wasn't on jump stat, just us and I think the, you know, another group like the uh, Pathfinders. And that was all. So we still got jump pay. And um, um, so you, you, you sort of self-selected yourself into it. So you were around like-minded guys. And so that's why my experience of that war is completely different than a lot of the stories. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I feel bad for guys that I lost, but I, you know, I'm not, I don't dwell on that. I don't feel bad about, you know, things that I did. I feel uh, proud of every single thing my, my team did, we did. And they, and my, uh, my unit, my Ranger unit, I mean, we were like, we would get up sometimes in the morning and run. We still had to run, if you believe it or not. And we would run through what we called legs. You know, even though they were in Hunter First, they were still to us legs. And we would run through their barracks at like five o'clock in the morning, which, you know, just pissed everybody off. But we were so proud of, you know, that we could piss people off, not only in the back, but out in the front, you know, whatever, wherever we were at, we wanted to like cause trouble. Yeah. Ken told so me I guess you guys were troublemakers. Ken was Ken, you know Ken's not a big tall guy right whatever the minimum is to get in the army he's like two inches lower than that but here's the thing like one time some new guy came in to our unit and um he wanted to fight guys and we're sitting in our team you know our team house our team tents and this guy came in and I was sitting there and it was you know it was pissed me off pissed me off because he he was kind of drunk and he was really mouthing off about how he could beat anybody, you know, what you guys are so tough, you know, and all this shit. So I went, no, come on. So we went around the back of the tent and now this is a cheap shot. I'm sorry, but I cold cocked him. I came from the bottom and I hit him right in the face and knocked him clear down into the road and he rolled and <laughs> Miller and I did high fives. We thought that was the greatest <laughs> thing in the world until suddenly he shows back up with that platoon it was like the first platoon and they're all like, Oh, what a cheap shot. You're never going to fight. These guys are this one guy that's my size is standing in front of me and he's good. You know, he's pointing his finger and stuff like that. And he touched Miller and it was a mistake. The guy took a swing at Miller and Miller caught the swing in his mouth, bit through his knuckle, you know, just almost bit his finger completely off and then got on him on his ear and bit his ear off and spit it. So he did that way before, uh, you know, the boxer did. Spit the ear out. Blood was going everywhere. And all of us just stood back in shock and went, you fucked up. You you know that. You should never fight somebody that's shorter than you are because we couldn't get him off. He kept, we, we, we were all trying to pry him off. But he just kept beating this guy up. It was like tragic. And we went, you know, it was M was, Miller Miller neglected to tell me that story. Well, he's not going to tell that story. No, <laughs> well, but I witnessed it. Tell 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 me then what what it was like when you first showed up at your unit at at hundred and first corps. What was it like getting there as a new guy? Well, here's okay. So I'll tell you what it was like because I was Mister Odie Clody. Like I didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't smoke mm -hmm. dope, didn't even cuss, and believed in God. I even you know how weird am I? And I show up. And so we're, it was like the first or second day and this guy named Marty Martinez, which was one of the point men who had a huge body count. And, and he goes, yeah, the goddamn good. And I said, um, excuse me, he really shouldn't use the Lord's name in vain. Oh, this guy went freaking off on me. It just was so pissed off at me. And what had happened was in our unit, one of the, somebody got really pissed off at the company commander, which was the before I got there, and blew his foot off. So they lost the company commander, and they got a new commander about the same time I came in. So I come in a little too clean, a little too, like, I didn't cuss and everything like that. And now I got the guy who's got the biggest body count in our unit pissed off at me. And I'm like, so he... So it wasn't a few weeks later that I was, I had to go, we had the ammo bunker. We had to go, I had to go down to the ammo bunker. I was told to go to the ammo bunker and, and 
And we had a machine gun nest thing that we would man all night long. And so I go to get all of the claymores and all that. And you had to climb down into this bunker and it was dug in the ground. We had tons of C4 and every kind, all kinds of shit inside this thing. And I get in there and I, and I find the claymores. And as I pull it, I've like a thermal grenade starts oh, cooking shit. off. And I had no time. I had like just dropped everything and just made my way up. I had to go out through the sink. And Dixie Dog, or one of this dog, she came over to see why I was there. I wanted to get some food. And I grabbed a hold of her and I ran like 15 feet. There was a bunker and I jumped in this bunker and then was like the whole earth blew up. We That thing blew up and we had PCP covering on top of the sandbags and that shit was bound bouncing down and bouncing around and hand grenades were cooking off machine gun ammo was flying you know everything was cooking off and in the the commander of of the uh at, at eagle called in to see he thought the north uh vietnamese had did an airstrike because it was such a big explosion you know down it was me so in through the clouds i come walking i finally i like m make my way through i still got dixie had scrambled out of my arms and I still have her dog tag. I still have it today. And I walked out and I went like, uh, <laughs> hello. I, it's okay. I mean, what do you say when you, when you blew up all of our ambient? I, I think the, the correct bunker. answer was the NVA got us. We had sappers on the wire. I didn't think about that. I, was like, <laughs> I wanted to use, but it, I had no, I just went, eh. It was uh, that was a nightmare because I had to go down and explain what had happened to these these young second lieutenants that were in S two or something. And anyway, uh, I got to uh, take a minute to uh, give a shout out to our sponsors for the show, and then I got I definitely have more questions for you, Larry. Um, okay. So I want to tell the viewers out there about Silent. This is you can find them at slnt.com. Silent, and these guys make these various bags. You see a couple different models and sizes here. These are uh, Faraday bags, so you can put your laptop, your cell phone, your tablet, whatever kinds of devices you like to use uh, in here, and it stops people from you know stealing your data, getting a hold of your signal, um, or if or if you just want to go dark for whatever reason. Some of you guys, um, there's a variety of reasons you might want to do that. Uh, and yeah, so check them out. They're at slnt.com. You can also uh, find these available at sapgear.com, another sponsor of the show. Um, so definitely go check them out. And then the other sponsor for this show is uh, 10,000. 10,000 makes uh, workout gear. It's 10,000.cc. Uh, these are their shorts. I, I use these shorts when I work out. They're awesome. Probably the best pair of shorts I've ever owned, actually. And um, these things are great. Use them when I do kettlebell exercises and stuff like that. And again, 10,000.cc. The promo code you can use is TEAM to get 15% off your order. Um, so I hope you guys will check out 10,000. Definitely worth it if you're staying active. And then just take a second to tell you guys about uh, we have our T-shirts and our merch oh, cool. too. If you guys are interested. Got T-shirts, coffee mugs, all that good stuff. Um, the link is down in the description. So, um, yeah, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, Oh, Larry, uh, just to clarify for people out there who have maybe have not read your book yet or don't know too much about, you know, our, our military during the Vietnam War, could you describe what the LERPs were and what their mission was? LERPs are Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. And even though we came 75th Rangers, it was still the same, the same tactics. But we would go five, six men on a team, and there would usually be two teams would go out into a, you know, into a, a grid square or several grid, grid squares that, that we had gotten intelligence on. And we would go out sometimes 30 miles away, you know, for, or further away than the line unit. So we would be the eyes and ears of the division. You know, there's different guys that call themselves LERPs that were LERPs in the division, but they were short, you know, around for infantry units. We were we would we worked real close with FOB one, which was Ford Operations Base One uh, Special Forces guys SOG, and so we shared intel. And sometimes we did SOG missions. We didn't even know there were SOG missions, but that mission into the Ashaw Valley that first time was like a SOG mission, even though, you know, we didn't get a T-shirt, which I'd love to have, by the way, or shorts for doing that. But that that was that was our mission. And sometimes it would be ambushes 
if we would see a, a, a unit that we could ambush, we would do a, either a hasty ambush or, or, or literally go in and set up. I've done that. We've done that before where we'll, you know, uh, ambush a, a, a unit that's been moving into the area. And we were up, we were up in um, i which mm -hmm. I-Corps, which was way Fuba out to the Ashaw Valley, um, would, would have been west. But that's, Kind of did. So tell tell us yeah. then about uh, about your first insertion, your first mission as a LERP. Um, they my first I you know what I remember was the helicopter ride because even though I jumped out of planes, I'd never been in a helicopter, and it was kind of unsettling to be sitting in the center of that thing, and it just lifted up. It was just the strangest experience. That's what I remembered was, well, actually, it's not what I remember. What I re remember was I forgot my rifle which is like the most embarrassing. Imagine your first mission and I'm all excited and I go down to the um, to the pad, the launch pad where the helicopters were warming up. And I remember um, the team leader going like, uh, where's your rifle? And I went like, and I just turn and I sprint it almost like tears are coming down my eyes back to my, to the hooch. And I gra you know, grabbed my car 15 and ran back down. But it was so embarrassing. So I was living through the shame and then the excitement of the helicopter ride. And um, the, the first mission was uneventful. The second mission was the mission where Linder's guys got all shot up. So that was, we found this huge bunker complex. And um, I, I remember this deer was chasing these monkeys. It was weird. And that, it, it sounded like the whole NVA Fifth NVA regiment was running down the hill towards us, and we were we had a twelve man we called a heavy team, and we were waiting to be, you know, for all these NVA to run into us. And it was this deer, this deer came by, and then a monkey came by. It was like what? <laughs> so that, and then I, I was lucky because I was on. This was Ber Sergeant Burnell, which is a kind of a famous Ranger, eighty second Airborne guys know him there. He's in for life. He led, he led that mission because it was, um, it was so, uh, it was a big deal as it actually turned out to be. And the other young sergeant got killed um, in his section. So we ended up staying out there till they got everybody out. And we ended up staying out there for like a couple of days. Like we didn't have enough backup if we'd have got into a big fight like that one team did we'd have been in a lot of trouble so they had us lay dog and we just laid in the rain it was raining the hardest rain i've ever seen it rained so hard that you know i just would look up and i couldn't even see my claymore mine said i couldn't you couldn't see that far ahead of you so we knew that the enemy couldn't see either so we just sort of like kicked back and waited for a couple of days till they could get a helicopter in and get us it, so was was, was, was this the operation where you were um you were wrapped in your in your chill liner and uh, the NVA walked within like six feet of the patrol? Oh, that was like the second mission or something like that. Yeah, the the um that that was a that really I got a lot of gravitas from that because I had set up at night and I I set I was right on the edge of the trail and and I had a a, a poncho liner. And so I kind of it was really cold and I wrapped myself in the poncho liner and I actually had um, I'd set my rifle over here and my hands were inside and I heard something. It was like about four in the morning or something like that. And I lifted up into a half sit up and right there walking was an NVA soldier it was like he came within just a, like a meter of of me and so i just froze and then the guys were behind me were all fro you know they were obviously all frozen too and we had something like 20 guys or they said 20 i forget how many it was a lot walked past when i got through i was so glad i had done lots of sit-ups earlier in my life so i was really i had a strong core because i literally kept a half sit up for 15 minutes without even a, moving a hair so that was that was like scary, but it also meant I could take being around enemy really close, which, you know, the old guys went, OK, I want him on my team. So that was really that was I, I moved up in. Um, uh, what do you call it? Stature. I'm 
Huh? Stature. Yeah, that was the word I was searching for, stature. Um, sometimes, like, they would, you know, you never know how somebody's going to react in combat. And, like, everybody thinks because, of, you know, they can bench press hundreds of pounds and they're all in great shape. It means zero. It means absolutely nothing. In the scrawniest looking guys there are sometimes are the best lerps and the best rangers there can be a they'll never give up they're just hard as nails and they're afraid of nothing but one time we took out a, a young guy who was smarter than all of us he was really smart kid and he freaked out he ended up shooting up he got surround they were surrounded but we're always surrounded i mean that's part of the the drill and he got so freaked out he just started firing his m16 and actually shot one of our guys holy shit and I always remember it's like you've got to test these guys. You got to test somebody before you really get on a team. So all of our guys were had been through the the you know a, a test, so to speak. You know, going out on a mission where you're going to be surrounded, mm -hmm. and you are there is no infantry coming to your rescue except we'd have air rifles that would come. You know, once you got into a firefight, but you know that still might be thirty minutes away. It, your sector that you talk about your that your unit covered in the book was pretty interesting because it encompassed like some pretty historical areas like the like Hamburger Hill, Ashaw Valley, a uh, few other notable places. Uh, it was a pretty was, am I right to say it was a pretty hot area? If you didn't get wounded, we used to say you were gay. I mean, there, <laughs> um, I know that's not probably the right thing to say in today's world, but that was the way we joked around. It was like with them shit you know yeah you're this was it was it was teeming i mean it, if you look at the at the ho chi Minh trail the way it came in it dropped in from laos right in the yasha valley went right over and then they could go into into way fubai on um on the rest of the way down, yes and, the and, and way Fire city base. was in that area also yeah way city was that's where if that's where our we we were close to that that's where our rear camp eagle was 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 about five miles from there or something like that real close but could, yeah it was a hard could, could you tell and us then there was the rung rung valley that was another one you all we every almost after the first couple of i mean almost every mission i went on we got contact some form of contact either we would see enemy or we got in a firefight and got shot out one or the other could you tell us about the mission this is kind of a, an interesting one with the black boxes that they wanted you to implant uh, or, or in place, I should say. Mm -hmm. You mean when the helicopter got shot down or it, was uh, that, was that on the, was that on the way back? Yeah. If you yeah, could tell, tell us about that mission and, and uh, I thought that was Miller, interesting. Miller was on that with me. And so Miller was, in, Miller was the sergeant in charge. I was still a spec forward then. And we were planting black boxes and they were just these black, boxes with a little aerial and we would you know they had it marked and where where they were going to be and supposedly if any tanks or heavy stuff went by there it would you know the, the vibrations they would call in airstrikes so we'd been doing that for a couple of days and the last day we were leaving and the helicopter takes off and hit a tree and it lobbed off about three foot of the blade so this thing and we were way in the hell up and he couldn't land back down because he was out over this big canyon. So he just dove, dove the helicopter. And it was, I don't know if you've ever been in a helicopter that lost four foot of the rotor blade. It only has that one rotor. It's like you're in a, a washing machine. And luckily the guy got, or, you know, auto rotated the last little bit, but we hit really hard you know, so hard that everybody banged up against the roof and then banged back down. And then, you know, we had, it was weird when that's, when something crashed, when you crash like that, because you don't have a map for that. You don't know where you're at or you don't have your map li lined up. So you're on your own, you know? And so we had to set up a perimeter around the helicopter and took forever before they could, you know, get a big, another chopper in to pull that one out. And Miller and I were the last two, we stayed to the very end. But there's this one more story about that sure. helicopter, that crash. So we come back, and and Miller had brought had picked up a big bone, uh, like a water bison's bone, and and I remember 
we always sort of had this competition and and I said I could knock with that bone that canteen cup off Miller's head. So he stood there and I was back at the end of the hooch and I threw it really hard and it missed. And of course it hit him in the head, split his head open. And now he's got blood all running down. So he's making himself like an Indian and, and he's like, you know, now I know I'm going to catch it because I have to take the punishment from what I just did. And, you know, I just stand there and Miller threw that thing as hard as he could. And I put my hand up and it hit my hand and broke my fingers. So now, you know, we're actually, this would have been an article 15 if, if, you know, we'd have been found out, but we go down to the aid station. Luckily we crashed in the helicopter. So we went, yeah, we were in a terrible helicopter, <laughs> that helicopter crash. Miller's all bleeding and stuff. And I'm, you know, my fingers broken. And so and I, I put on, they put me in a, like a cast and I cut it down and I still trained. And I actually, I've got pictures of me in a McGuire rig and I've got this cast on my hand, you know, that's how gun hole we were. I mean, we didn't, you didn't go, you get to the hospital and you come back to your unit. We wanted to go back out and, you know, get going, which is not again, what you normally hear, you know, people, people say, but yeah. And was this about the time that your unit started going into A. Shaw Valley or was that later? It was later. Um, we didn't go into the Asia Valley till after I got back from Reconda School, which was March. Okay, let's, March nineteen sixty nine. Let, let's uh, let's cover that first. I mean, before we get there, was there any other yeah. like notable missions before Reconda School that you think are important to to bring up? I mean, I know there um, was a lot of them. I mean, I I sort of felt like I had a sixth sense. We were talking about this earlier, and and I was and I'd walk point, and I would like know when something was going to happen i would just know it and was one time um i stopped and we i got off the trail and i walked uh, burford was the team leader at the time and he so he's he was behind me and i left and i went into the i just had this feeling i went into the jungle and i went around the trail was was going down this way and i went so I go around in the jungle and I come out behind and I, I was stepping over this log and I looked down and I started counting, you know, NVA was like, I just froze and just stopped breathing. Stop. I mean, I had my car 15, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I lost count of the number of guys that were sitting on the ground. They were talking to each other. And one guy sort of heard me and he even turned around and he looked right at me. But, you know, we had, total camouflage on we had tiger fatigues on so i blended in and you know you just don't think some white american's going to show up you know in the jungle when they didn't even hear us but they that we would have walked into an ambush but i walked around behind them and so i literally i did, made the decision not to fire them up because I, I was too close i literally could reach down and go excuse me you guys i'm now going to shoot you so uh, you know i i just held my fire and backed up and and burford remember look he said he counted the number of ent of kooks on the ground in my eyes he could tell that i saw something because my eyes were like gigantically big i'd never seen any you know thing like this so we go back and we we set up and and a loony called in the, an extraction helicopter called him for an extraction and I was sitting at this bush and I started thinking, did I imagine that? Did I imagine? I mean, that couldn't have been true. That, and then, sud then suddenly a guy pops up. And he was like 50 meters away, which is not that far. And he, he popped up and he had um, glasses and he was like looking around, looking at the trail that I'd left as I ran, <laughs> as I ran like a little girl out of there. And he like <laughs> tracked. And I remember he was like looking right at me and I was going like, perfect. And Burford was over talking, okay, now what we're going to do is, blah, 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 blah. and I'm going, like, they're looking at me. <laughs> so Burford came over and I said, and I saw the one, this the guy with the glasses, took his glasses down, and I saw him talking to one of his guys, and he, go, he goes like that, which meant to flank us, and this guy took, he had a, uh, like, an American parachute, which is a camouflage parachute, and he flicked it once and put it over his head, and he disappeared. And I went like, oh, my heart was like, oh, now I can't see him, but I know this guy's coming around, you know, going to flank us. And so, you know, Burford goes, okay, here's what we're going to do. And we had six guys. Um, uh, Chambers and I are going to stay behind. 
on the count of three, your guys are going to take up running. And I remember saying, like, what if Chambers doesn't get to stay behind? What if you went to count and I get to go? Shut up. <laughs> and so he goes, I don't know, I had a weird sense of humor under circumstances. He goes, one, two, three. And we literally had to stand up because there was a brush right there and like fired up the guys that were in the, that were before they shot at us. And so that, that was, I never forgot that mission. And, and then you guys, I, I take it, broke contact to the, to the LC yeah. and got out of there. Yeah. We got out of there and then, um, then they bring in what's called the, um, what was our reactionary force? Which the, was, um, yes, I, I, in SF, it would have been like the, the Mike force, uh, or a, hatchet, yeah, like or a hatchet same, same, yeah. Had, yeah, same, same type thing. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's talk about Rakondo School uh, because that's you know the title of your book, Rakondo, and a, and a couple chapters yeah. in the book are all about it. I mean, that was a very unique course that was held in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, could you tell us, um, you know, why did why did you go? Why did you get sent? What was the what was the school all about? Well, the the school was. Um, actually called Mac V fifth special forces Recondo school. And the, it was actually Westmoreland's, uh, uh, pride and joy school in the, in the army. That's me right there. That came from, that was that tape. I told you that they'd found. Yeah. That's me back then. My hat's a little bit too small, but saying you get kicked out of school. But what made it really interesting is that we ran through, um, there's my guide, the guy, the Vietnamese guy right there on, the bottom left he's a great guy if you ever go to vietnam i'll give you his name yeah and, and check um, out check out larry's uh he has a youtube channel just type in larry chambers and he'll come up and, and he has a bunch of cool videos on there that you guys can check out i'm sorry Larry. there's go, also go ahead yeah there's also a website called larry and that's dash chambers.com and i have a whole bunch of stuff so um so the first week they try to weed out the guys that aren't physically strong and you're tired i mean you've been in you you to, first of all, it was an invitation only. You got invited, but you were in, and you were sent by your unit. So it was a kind of a big deal to get sent there because that meant you were going to be a team leader when you came back. And um, so it was a real honor to go. But everybody was nervous because of the swim, the dreaded swim. There was the run. The, the run was, eh, so you get through the run. But on the second week, they had the, the swim. And there was a lot of stuff that you were doing. It was nonstop. I mean, you were up till late at night and, you know, all, all training all day long, you know, jump, you know, practicing Maguire rigs and, and repelling and, you know, everything that any good, you know, combat uh, unit would train you for. Uh, first aid, you know, where you'd have to give yourself serving albumin or at least know how to give yourself a, but they had big needles back then. So there was lots of blood everywhere when we went through that part of the course. But the swim, you'd have to swim out 200 meters. And at the time, I was like a lousy swimmer. And I, I didn't know really how to swim. And I to just sort of side thing. But if you touch, there was this two special forces sergeants out in this pontoon boat out in the ocean. And you had to swim around it and swim all the way back. And that eliminated a lot of guys if they couldn't make the swim. I just remember how exhausting it was because you also ran that day and you're doing a lot of stuff. And so then go through all of that. And then we come to the last day. And this is what gives it the distinction of the only school the army's ever had where you could get killed in it. A lot of the buildings were named after, um, you know, guys that were killed in the school, you know, there, there, they, because we did a live um, alert mission. And you would rotate um, at each point. So they wanted you to, you know, be a team leader. They wanted you to be a slack man. They wanted you to be a point man. They wanted you to be rear secure. You know, you go through the whole thing. So the first two days we're out there and it's like just a normal alert mission. And this mission was pulled um, near La Trang. And, uh, La Trang. and suddenly I'm walking along and I... I walk into, you know, four or five guys sitting in the middle. There was probably, it was way more than that because we found like 10 or 15 backpacks. But I, so I fired them up and I turned around and the guy that behind me took off running. He broke the protocol. The protocol, you know, is I sit down the line and fire. The next guy does. And 
he took off and it got the other guy worried. You know, we didn't know who these guys were that were in our school. And so I watched these two guys running back in the jungle and I'm still out there. So I hit the ground and I just, you know, kept putting fire down until suddenly the, the on the, the, the school, we'd, we'd have two instructors that would go out with us. And Louis LePage, I can still just remember him. He was just like, he was like God. He was like the, the toughest guy I'd ever seen in my life. And he comes running through the jungle. He doesn't care about bullets screw bullet he's got a he's got his um he's he carried a, a a thumper you know an m79 and he shoots the shoots at it and it hit the tree and i remember going like over my head like bing bang bing it didn't go off because it didn't go far enough to arm and he's he's a, he, so he comes out where i'm and we both fire and maneuver back and so he was furious at the guys that ran he was so pissed off and he goes chambers you and and um my slack man, you're gonna walk us back there. I'm going, oh my God, why do I keep getting myself where I'm gonna get do good now? I have to go back in there. And so I was so I so we went back later that same day and I'm walking along and suddenly this North Vietnamese guy walked right out in front of me and just like that. And he looked at me and I looked at him and he started to run. And I took off running and I ran after him and I tackled him like a football tackle. And I got him down on the ground and and matter of fact, LePage was a little pissed off at me because that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to fire him up. But I could see the guy didn't have a weapon. I was going to shoot an unarmed guy. So I figured I could tackle him. And he turned out to be this young lieutenant. I've still got his um, – I, I have it right here. I brought it to show. But this was the belt buckle that he was wearing. Let's see if you can see that. An NVA belt the, buckle. NVA belt buckle. So he was – and I've actually tried to find that guy in my trips back to Vietnam, but that, so we captured this, I captured this NVA officer, like, I thought I was the hero of the day. We get back and it was like, no, we give it, you know, there's like, you know, business as usual. Oh, you captured it. It was like, no, this is special forces. This isn't like Tinker Toys, you know? And I, but the, but LePage um, ended up getting me a, an R&R &R to Hawaii. I got seven day you know, for doing that. So I was all happy for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Ken Miller and, and I think yourself both, you know, killed enemy in, in Rikondo school, but I mean, you actually captured an enemy, which is like exceedingly rare. I mean, everyone yeah, was trying to for, do that. Yeah. Yeah. But this was just totally an accident. Actually, when I, I've written back to try to find this guy, because I always hoped he turned out to be you know, would do good, you know, something. And I even went to uh, Kandao, which is an island where they sent all the prisoners to try to, I don't know, I had this delusion of grandeur that I could try to find this guy. But um, I, 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 we, I, the, 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 you know, they brought in the mic force. Like you said, they brought all that shit in. So suddenly we're surrounded by 300 guys and, you know, we're all surrounded by all these guys. And they were, they, they would, um, they were interviewing my prisoner and the South Vietnamese were, you know, just, they would just step on his ball. You know, like I always see these movies where they, they're, you know, you've got, how do you torture somebody to, you know, mm -hmm. use that waterboarding? They just stepped on the guy's nuts with their boots. And the guy was going like, oh, he was telling everything. So I, that pissed me off. This guy was being tortured. So me and my slack guy, Duty, that was his name, Duty. We go over and we, I don't know if Duty pushed the Arvin guy away, but we kind of protected the guy all night. He was ours. We risked our life to capture him. We were going to let the South Vietnamese kill him because they were just butcherers. They were, you know, terrible. And um, then they took him back. They, they actually took him up in a uh, Maguire rig. Or was it Maguire rig? Or, yeah, Maguire rig. Out. And then I, so... That was my three weeks in Rikondo school, which was, it was hard. It was really, I, and I thought a lot of guys, I thought everybody that went there graduated. And I'd find out later that the guys that, a lot of them that went there and they didn't graduate, but it, nobody tells you that. Just they didn't get the, the Rikondo patch. Uh, we have some questions and I'm actually struggling to pull it up. Do you have them, D? Um. Sorry, we have we have some audience questions for you as, as well, Larry. Um, 
It's, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to are get these, this. I didn't mean to are get these from North Vietnamese? Are, are they North Vietnamese uh, they, questions? Po possibly, because... possibly. So Alejandro uh, has one. Uh, I still have your book, Death in the Asha Valley from Sandhill mm -hmm. PX from OSUT at Benning. As Jack said, a lot of us going into bat always strive to be better, wanting to live up to the legacies you guys created. Thank you for coming on. Sua Sponte. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alejandro. We have a few more. Okay. You wanna... Um, you want to get them at the end? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's no questions there. It's just. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll get mm. we'll get to a few more towards the end of the uh, the interview. So yeah, you you kept the guy's belt and his belt buckle and wore it after that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I stripped him immediately of his belt buckle because that I got offered five hundred dollars for that by a leg officer in <laughs> Saigon, there, you know. But I wouldn't give it up. And when you did finally graduate from Rakondo School, uh, you go get back to your unit, and now you're a team leader. Yeah, so you go back and you're on, you're a team leader, and I um um well, I wasn't a well, I was a team leader, but that came later um that uh lightning mission happened shortly after and i i they made me a sergeant and i was on r, &R so some time went by and then suddenly they brought it was like they wanted to get and I, this sounds egotistical but the best of the best so they got a bunch of us guys we're all sergeants and we're going to go on the first alert mission in, back in the Ashaw Valley, the last time anybody had been in there was the 173rd, and they lost 37 helicopters in so many minutes. So it was a bad place to go. And, you know, we were just starting to, to build all of the different fire bases on, on the way out to the Ashaw Valley. And so they wanted us to, they wanted eyes and ears out there. So we spent five days on the border and here in, um, at night, we would in the daytime we would see hundreds of North Vietnamese in the valley, and um, and then at uh, night we would hear them cutting wood, and I, I showed you, you know, from going back, what I'd brought back. I guess I can show it now. Huh? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'd gone back to Hamburger Hill or close to where we where we were. We got struck by lightning, believe it or not, on our last day of the mission, and we were all like paralyzed. And luckily. I mean, we lost Kamo. We had one radio that Kamo finally, and the, um, the you know they they we got out in a, in a, in penetrators. That was what they sent down. It was a basket for Linder, and then the penetrators for the rest of us. Because when that lightning but, struck, it like blew up your grenades and claymores and everything. Oh, too. it blew. Yeah, we had all of our our claim. Luckily, just before that happened, I remember reading the back of my Claymore mind, thinking like, that's a little too close and reading the back of it. So I went down and I moved it out further. When this lightning hit, I just remember this white light and there's like no sound for like a multi zillionth of a second, a flash. And then I remember going up in the air and blowing blown into a thousand pieces, this deafening sound, and then hitting the ground, which seemed like later, like I always thought I was blown in pieces and then, God went like, nah, not ready yet. Then put me back together, threw me back down on the ground. So I land like down this hill and I can remember I couldn't move. And I looked down at my legs and smoke was coming off my clothes. And it was like, I couldn't move, but I could move my arms. And I finally kind of got my senses back. I had no rifle. I didn't know where I was. And I, and I crawled. This is the scaredest I'd ever been in Vietnam. I never really got that scared, but this scared me. I crawl back up the hill and I look around and where we were was all a burnt out circle and no one was there. They were all also blown away. But I, for a few minutes, it seemed like an eternity. I was like, Oh my God, I am alone here. You know, I'm going to get my throat cut. Where's my rifle. And I went, so I start started looking around and I found my clacker clacker is what you use to blow you know, hard plastic. To, I don't know if you use those for claymores, but it's a hard plastic was melted. So oh we figured the lightning came down through the antenna. The radio man had put this antenna up in a thunderstorm. Mm, questionable reason for that. And sent, we had to send a sit rep. And when he did, the lightning went down and it didn't hit us directly or would have killed us. But we got not only the, the explosion, um, 
um, Gary Linder's backpack had a percussion grenade and then that blew up. So we got that. And then the backblast from all of the claymores that were around us. So we got the backblast and that's probably what, why we were all in some form of paralysis for some of us did, for a day, you know, did, a day and a half. You, you write that when the radio man clicked the hand mic to send yeah. up the sit rep, that was when the lightning struck. That's when the lightning hit. Yeah. And I just remember just this white light, which is kind of scary when you think about it. Oh, I am dead. And I kind of was, I kind of just remember the last thing I said was fuck. I mean, it was pissed me off. I mean, why, you know, like the last day of the mission or something, I just didn't want to get blown up. I mean, anyway. Um, so long story short in 2015, I go back and hire a guide and go back to the hamburger Hill and I climb up to the top and I'm looking all around and they've got it really laid out. Cool. They built steps up. There's a, like a, a little shack down below where it tells the history of it. And of course, the North, you know, first liar wins or second liar, but they tell how they defeated the enemy. You know, they defeated us and all, which was bullshit. You know, it didn't never happen. And so at the top of the hill, there's a topa and, a, um, you know, dedicated to their their guys that died up there because they lost a lot of guys. And, we, you know, you know, we had the third of the 187th, I think it was, that went up there and they lost like 87. I mean, it was a hundred guys wounded. I mean, it was, it was so bad. We didn't get paid for our pay skipped a month because, you know, the guys that did pay and graves registration, graves registration were the same guys. So they were backed up from that one, you know, from hamburger Hill. So I wanted to go up and look around. I'm, I'm digging around and I find this, which is a log that was in a bunker. Um, and I, and I just, I stuck it in my backpack and I thought, wow, I wonder, I'll bet I heard those guys cutting that log, you know, back then we could have heard them because that that's where we think we were hit was on that, was somewhere on that hill. I mean, it's a kind of a long hill and um, it's, in, it's fun to go back to those places because you, you would never know, um, you know, cause the jungle covers everything up. Fire bases are all covered over. I couldn't find Camp Eagle. I found the, the graveyards that we used to that were close by us but so much except um except the hamburger hill they the enemy has preserved the enemy they're not our enemy the the vietnamese have preserved that you know as a, a site you know like they did din bin Phu. Mm -hmm. you can go to all these cool places the museums are just um, amazing but that was that was that uh, so then I, needless to say, I was kind of nervous about going out after that mission. I was, and I went out a couple times and I started overseeing things because I was waiting for the next shoe to drop. I'd never been in an, ex well, it was the second explosion I'd been in, um, but I'd never been in anything like that before. And I, uh, so I was probably a little bit freaked out. So I thought I would do something uh, safe. So I started flying belly, <laughs> in the, you know, which turned out to be not as, so safe because we were taking fire all the time and what, what, that's what, where what, I, is that, what does that mean for folks out there what does it oh, mean to fly belly okay every uh, ranger team lerp team has to have one of their own guys in the helicopter to you know to help them get in and out of the helicopter so you've got all this backpack on and you've got your ammo and your guns and and you've got one guy that like you, you had to be recondo trained so you know i qualified you had to be able to put the ropes together rope ladders, Maguire rigs, everything. And, the, and that's your job. You're in the back, the two pilots are in the front and the two door gunners are on the side. And so that's when Miller's team was in a, they were in the second helicopter that um, or they went out to pick up Miller's team. And I guess they got shot down and the, hel the, the blade went through one of the guys in Miller's team's head or killed him. And so then we fly over and we get shot at. Um, so we, I still remember tracers going up, you know, a little open window, every, doors open, the tracers will go by like that and the chopper goes around and all this stuff. And so we came back in and we had to make four separate uh, uh, um, uh, trips. extractions, yeah, yeah. trips. And so I would throw the, as we were coming in, because the helicopter had crashed and the guys had to climb up on the crash helicopter to get in. So 
I sort of helped them back the helicopter in. I don't know if you know what I mean. Like sort of like I got out on, I threw the rope ladder out and then I climbed down on the skid. I climbed out on the skid and I would, and I could see the pilot and I could, you know, hear him and talk to him and all that. And I would say, okay, we're all, you know, I was talking to him while the door gunners were watching out to the side. And so when I, when I came in, the, we took some fire and I really didn't have my rifle because I'm standing outside the helicopter. So I flipped the bird to this North Vietnamese guy that was shooting at us, which Miller remembers. Everybody on the ground was cheering. They thought it was so cool. They wanted to see me get shot off of the, off of the uh, skid would have been really, that would have, that would have made their day, but he missed. And I went in and I'm joking, of course, you know, and I helped the guys in and I got my, I got an air medal with a V for valor for that mission. So and that, I mean, that's my proudest medal. It, it sounded pretty dicey. I mean, like you, was it you and Miller were like the last two guys out? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, but you were, how, and how long were you guys on the ground, you two by yourselves waiting for the. Well, Miller was on the ground with another, with one, with his radio guy. And I was still in the helicopter. I would take everybody back and then I would come back in the helicopter. Right, right. But right. Miller stayed on the ground for like 30. We had to refuel, which was scary because. The, all he had was cobras flying above them they could talk to but um you know and then we finally we got out there and i um we couldn't wait to get out i couldn't wait to get it over with and i was i had so much adrenaline pumping and miller is so light i was on that ladder and i get down and you know the old ueys from the from the um from the skids to up inside it's a, it's a, it's a jump i mean it's a hike i mean it's a I don't know how many feet it is, a couple of feet. And I was so pumped. I grabbed Miller by the back of his web gear and threw him almost out. He landed and almost flew out the other side of the helicopter. I was like so stoked to, you know, not that I was so strong, but I was just, you know, like all hot, hyped up. And that, that by this point, you're uh, starting to get kind of short too, right? As far as yeah, your time in the war. Exactly. So I what I did was I started taking radio relay missions and I would – do um, like I was on ripcord when they got hit, and and that was an amazing thing. I'd never been around an infantry unit, and never want to be around infantry unit again. Scary, because you're sort of trapped on a hill. You know, I'm used to hiding in the bushes or something, or flying away, but they had to stay there and fight. It was like, oh my god, when's this night going to get over with? You know, it was like freaky. But anyway, I um, then at the end they asked me to go and and recruit guys, which is I usually do for the actually the better looking guys they asked to go do it. So I don't think Miller got asked or Linda, I know didn't get asked <laughs> to go do that, you know, cause they uh, wanted you to represent the Lerps, the Rangers. Could, uh, could, could you tell us a little bit about how like your, your unit and how the war changed during your time there? Cause I remember you write in your book about how your sector, your AO like drastically expanded as time went yeah. on and that they started, like you guys were getting teams were getting inserted sometimes twice a day Make, oh, you know, yeah. it, it sounded like insanity. Well, this was to our, our, our wonderful President Richard Nixon, just the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. I'm still, I, I am not a of, crook. I'm not a crook. My, I remember having a dream one time that I got to go dig up his body and I was going to drag it back. Anyway, that was another story. But, you know, he had said he had ran in the 68 election on, um, to name, pull the troops out, which he did. But when he, it was a trick for us. It was a trick because all they pulled out all of these companies and they expanded RAO. So we ended up having to, RAO like quadrupled in size. I mean, they were flying all by the time we'd left in 70, you know, they were, they were flying, you know, from oh, all over the place in, in the, in I-Corps, but it, it they just, it, the reason why I didn't volunteer to go back, uh, because it, as you can see in my, I'm sort of, gun, I was sort of gun home. But we got this young second lieutenant, and he, um, you know, just out of jump school and officer school and all kind of school thing, and he goes, and so he takes me out on, a, we go on a, a recon um, in a helicopter, we go out looking for a DZ, and I said, you mean an LZ, sir? And he goes, no drop zone, DZ. And I go, why? He goes, well, you're a paratrooper, right? And I go, I am? I, go, I, I didn't jump out of a plane in two years. Like, 
we have to jump. You want us to jump out of the hell, jump out of plane? And he goes, yeah. He had this idea where he was going to, it was in the Ashaw Valley and he was going to, um, they were going to pin these guys in and then we were going to jump in and then we would, and I went like, you know, I'm getting really short here. I think I need to like find another profession, you know, and I don't yeah. know what happened to that guy. Yeah. Somebody's hunting, was, hunting for medals. Yeah. He was looking, you know what he wanted was the jump with a star, you yeah, know, he yeah. wanted a combat blast because no one, nobody with special forces jumped. I mean, you could go down to Latrang and jump with them and get your jump, your Arvin, I mean, your, yeah, your Arvin jump wings, but to a combat blast hadn't been since Korea. So, well, and, he was, and he, you don't, you, uh, a warp unit no isn't, reason. isn't a, isn't a mass, they're not going to do a mass tack infantry assault. I mean, that doesn't make it's sense. It's stupid. Yeah. It doesn't make it. That's what I mean. I thought, where are they getting these guys? Because this guy was, cuckoo you know it's like this is not our t-o-n-e not our, our 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 mission you know our mission is to go out with five six guys and find enemy and tell the other guys tell the good guys where the bad guys are end of the comp not you know it's not normandy we're not jumping you know anyway. so they took they sent you on the uh barry saddler recruitment drive for a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah, you know, I went back and recruited guys, and I would. And at first, I couldn't get anybody to go because I thought I was trying to, you know, I was what's called being profiling. I was like, yeah, I was Mister Man, you know, had all the double, double, um, hundred and first patches on my shoulders and Ricondo school, and had my body count rope and my NBA belt buckle, and I thought surely these guys will see me and immediately go, well, I want to be just like you. Instead, it was like they couldn't wait to get out of that tent. You know, I'd say what we're doing. And then finally, I would start telling this story about uh, I, I got a map of i -Corps And I said, look, you know, you guys are infantry. I'm going to tell you the story it was told to me. You know, you're going north. You're going to be out either on an infantry company and you'll be out. Could be for a month at a time. Could be six weeks, whatever it is, or you might get lucky and be on a fire base. You think you're lucky, but let me see this map. And I'd hold up the map and I go, I could buy this map on the black market. So every NVA commander has the same map. And so I said, look, what the LERPs do is we go out where the enemies we think are. They don't know where we are. They don't know where we're coming. So they don't see us and we're trying to find them. So Think about it this way. It's safer behind the lines than it is in front of them. And three hands went up. And then the next time I got, and then four hands went up. I got 26 guys and refilled, you know, because it had to be all volunteer mm -hmm. in our in our Ranger unit. And I refilled it before I left. I was real proud of that, that I got, you know, figured I could sell, then I could be a salesman later in life or something. So tell us about when, uh, when you finally, uh, finish your tour in Vietnam and, you know, getting on your freedom bird. The fight. Did I talk about the fight I got in? No, and, uh, uh, the, oh. the fight with the guy on the plane. Yeah. 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 I seem to always get into or start fight. Yeah. Fight. Okay. So I got in a fight anyway. So we're getting ready to go. And this guy was bragging about killing, killing, the gooks and he was talking about he was a bus driver he ran him over he was bragging about how many people he'd ran over and and so i'm sitting on this plane and i could hear the guy talking there's always somebody who's going to listen because if you've got you know 200 guys on the plane coming back from vietnam 150 of them have never been in the jungle and you know a small number had been in the infantry and three guys were special for i mean there was like nobody you know not a lot of guys you know, there's always somebody that would listen to some bullshit guy like that. So I'd had enough. And the guy sitting next to me was 173rd. And I said, do you want to go kill him or will you let me? And he goes, you go kill him first and I'll kill him second. So I got, and oh, here's what he did. He's at the back of the 707 quick. And back then the the, the seats where the bathroom was wouldn't, wouldn't recline. And he was like, there's the stewardess, 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 my seat won't go back. My seat won't go back. So I went back there and I was so fucking mad. I'd never been so mad in my life. Probably every single thing that had happened had boiled up in there. And I reached around and I grabbed this guy and I went inside of his shirt where I could grab his neck. He was kind of a heavy set guy. And I pulled him up right in my face. And I said, you shut up, that fucker. I'm going to cut your throat. I mean, just pushed him down as hard as I could. And then I, I come back and 
I remember walking back in the plane going, yeah, they were all applauding, you know, it was, it was, I kind of marched back with my 101st patches on and sat back down in my seat. And that guy never said a word the rest of the, we didn't even hear him. I don't even know he was on the plane after that. But yeah, anyway, so when I came back, I wasn't, I didn't go, oh, the hippies are, make me so sad. I feel so, uh, what I did, I'm so, I would like, bullshit. I had none, I just, I would, um, I never had that stuff happen to me, just maybe because they wouldn't do it or something. But I, I, I just I went back to college and um, University of Utah because I was a uh, non-Mormon, but I could get I heard I could get laid there. So that was like the most important thing. Oh, yeah. You remember that story? That was another story. Yeah. The postscript but, um, to your book is the stewardess on that airplane on the ride. Home. OK, so that, I should probably say that story because I get back and my friend Dave Cranning was. Also, he'd been wounded. He'd, he'd been shot up so bad, he had a battlefield amputation on the battle. They thought he was going to die. He'd got machine gun through the chest. His fingers were blown off. He was really in bad, bad in shape. And he came back and um, he had a brand new GTO and he let me use it to go down. And I, my last girlfriend before I left was Sue Hockstrasser and she was hot and she became a stewardess. And I, and so I was going to drive down and I called her and she was, you know, going to meet me. And I thought, Oh my God, this is going to be great. I'm going to get laid. I'm driving at 110 miles an hour, you know, down from down. It's from Sacramento. It's called the winner's <laughs> cutoff. And I'm going 110 miles. And I remember looking up in my rear view mirror and I saw this way in the back, like, you know, just lights flashing like that. And back then in 1969 or 70, I guess it used to be, it was this was during the summertime and I had on flip flops, you know, flip flops, and I'd taken them off. So I was driving barefoot and I heard and I remembered it's against the law to drive barefoot. So I was reaching underneath as he pulled up behind me and I'm stop I'm reaching under pulling on my shoes like that. So when he came up to the he asked me to open the door, and as I opened the door, I was met with a three fifty seven right in my face, and he was just like holding at me pulled me out onto the ground. I'm laying on the ground. I'm like, I just better be. And I was like, you know, I was like in a Mickey Mouse voice. You know, I, I, I never had a thr I thought I was going to get executed right there. What I didn't know was this was 1969. And the, the, um, the something, the Zodiac killer, Zodiac killer had killed people on this same area. And so these cops were not taking any chances. And, you know, and then he, he, I had a military ID, but I didn't have a driver's license and the car wasn't registered to me. I was like, and I did 110. He was, you know, you're doing 110. I went like, well, I'm trying to go get laid. I told him the truth. And so we sat in there and he had a brother that was in Vietnam. He let me go. He said, just slow <laughs> it down, learn, learn the new rules. You know, so I always thought like, wow, it was great. But I, I ended up going to the University of Utah and by then I got smarter. It was really funny. I guess my brain had a chance to mature, but suddenly, you know, I could go to college and then it was, you know, could pass tests and all that sort of stuff. Um, except in the really hard test, I did alert mission one time and to get the, to get a final that I crawled into this guy's office one night, which everybody in the department thought that was the coolest thing that ever had happened. Cause I got all the answers the old fashioned way. I thought, what are they going to do? Send me back to Vietnam? <laughs> but who gives a shit? But I, I got through that and uh, I always had, I always found a place. I'm like the guy that always finds the perfect parking place and the perfect place to live because I drive around and I know I'm going to find it. Six cents, whatever it is. And I drove past this. I, I, I had graduated in the only degree I could get, which was in the department of recreation because they didn't have a lot of, reading. I mean, there was some English attached to it. So I had this degree and I went down to take a test and there was, I went to you know, California, uh, the Manhattan beach, and there must've been 1200 people in taken for, for two positions. So I knew this wasn't going to happen. So I was driving around thinking, what am I going to do for a living? I went past a brokerage firm and I saw a brand new Porsche and a brand new Mercedes Benz. And we're like, I could do that, whatever that is. And went in and the guy said, this was 1974 and the market had crashed and everybody lost a lot of money. 
and they hired me. I ended up going to work, went back to New York, went to work for EF Hutton. And every move, everything I did went up because from 1975 on, the market just steadily went up and up and up and up. But I would get in arguments with people using common sense logic. Like back then you could get bonds. The, the They were called Big Macs. They were the municipal bonds for for New York City. And they were 10% with a 10% yield tax, double tax free. And I got a buck a bond, which is unheard of. And the old brokers would say, don't you realize you're screwing these people? And I go, I, look, I was just in New York. I looked around. Everybody had jobs. They just built, they had just completed the the the, the towers, the twin towers. This place is humming. How could it's not going to happen? And I I was right. And those bonds, everybody made a ton of money. So I started thinking, this is a piece of cake. <laughs> Everything I did was making money. And I thought I, I'm now going to become a real estate developer. So I started building condos in Park City, Utah. And I at one time I was the biggest um I had the biggest contractor in Summit County. We were, we built like 160 units down south and blah, 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 blah. And I hit the snag where I ended up losing like because it like $27 million or something like that. And it was really sad. Um, but I decided I, I moved back to California after that big loss, paid everybody back that I owed money to. And I came back and I went like, what can I do? You know, um, and I had all this experience and I thought I'd, I'd uh, written an article. I started writing articles and the very first article I wrote became a, a cover story on Pension World magazine. I, went, I'm, I had this knack for writing and I started doing that, and, you know, 50 books later. When uh, I, I know when That's a lot of life. when when a lot of uh, Vietnam veterans came back, I mean, it wasn't popular to talk about the war, and so I, I'm wondering, no. like, when did when did the idea um, get into your mind? I mean, is you and Gary and Ken and all of you wrote mm -hmm. about the war. I mean, what yeah. how how did that come about for you guys? Ken Miller, because of Ken Miller, it was about 20 years later, you know. And if you'll see, every war, the books come out. 10 or 15 or 20 years later, because people are, there's, there's been a gap and now they want to read about it. And Miller had written Tiger the Lurp Dog, which is our dog. Great novel. And, and he was, and that's how uh, he knew the editor at Random House. And Mil and Linder asked me to write about, you know, I told you about Recondo School and capturing the NBA officer. So, um, excuse me. So I wrote about 30 pages. There was it was single spaced. There was no paragraph breaks or nothing. And I sent it back to Linder, who had, you know, grown up with nuns beating his hand so he could spell and write everything perfect, you know. And he goes, It's great, but paragraphs don't go on for 20 pages. One paragraph. I went, oh, okay. So I sort of had to learn that on the job too. And I remember uh, he goes, you, you know, you ought to send this to my publisher. So I put 30 pages. I hired an editor to edit for me. I sent it to him. I sent a FedEx, uh, you know, on Wednesday and Friday, I get a phone call. And go, Hi, my name's Owen Locke. I'm with Random House. I want to buy your book. No wow. negotiation, no agent, nothing. And bang. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it was it was amazing. And that's why, you know, we're sort of clumped together. It's because of Miller, mm -hmm. Miller's contact, mm -hmm. you know. And, and now people are ready to start talking about the war and talking about these yeah, experiences. Yeah, well, they are still, I mean, I, I remember the last... Uh, I did a tour. Random House sent me on a tour and I went around and I spoke at B. Dalton's. And I remember this one B. Dalton. And this guy, this young guy goes, so are you crazy? Are you really crazy? I mean, he was asking all these stupid, ridiculous questions. And no. And then, so I have, as you can see, my sense of humor isn't necessarily for everybody. It's good for combat vets, but the average civilian is going <laughs> to get pissed off at me really quick. So I'm talking about no, I'm telling some story, and I may, and I'm talking about these Marines. This is a true story. We were out at out at this dump where we would test fire our weapons, or shoot rats, or whatever the hell we were doing. And these Marines walked by, and they were set up, and they were shooting. And I made something of. I said, like, yeah, the, these um, jarhead. I said jarheads. This woman gets up in the front, and she's got my book, and throws it at me, and goes. My husband was a Marine and he died in Vietnam. And she turned around and marched out. And the only thing I could think was to say was, I didn't kill him. Uh, 
I'm sorry. You know, this is just what happened. This with combat vets, I can make fun of Navy SEALs. I can make fun of Air Force Paracommandos. Um, because if I'm in that group, it's okay. But if you're not in the group, you better watch out or you're gonna have a mouthful of fists. <laughs> so it's it's like we, you know, we get to joke around about I mean, you know, I'm making light of a lot of stuff because that's probably how I bury things but um I, I, you know i feel like i feel like my sense of humor kept me sane in nom and and i would be very inappropriate like on one mission it might have been the Ashaw valley mission where we were going out and they were they were they were in the talk and they had big maps set up and this guy from s2 this captain was showing well there's uh we think there's 15,000 of the 5th NVA Regiment up here, and the, the fourth is a recon of 3,000 North Vietnamese coming down here. And we're going to insert you. And I remember raising my hand, and this thing is packed. We've got helicopter pilots, the two te you know, the teams, everybody's there. And I raised my hand, and he goes, uh, yes, Sergeant Chambers. And I go, like, should we even bring any food or anything, or just like a lot of extra ammo? And everybody's going, Chambers, shut up. You would get so pissed off because I would say these goofy comments but the way they painted it we weren't coming back so i figured <laughs> why well, why bring a bunch of extra stuff if we're only going to go out and get you know shot i don't know and you've made i mean you mentioned that a little bit but you've also went and like spent a lot of time in cambodia and made numerous trips back to vietnam what, what yeah. was that sort of like i mean retracing your old patrols in some instances what well i spent like? a lot of times 10 years in cambodia so you know, I was, you know, guys will say, yeah, I did, I did three tours in Nam. I go like, well, I did 10 years in Cambodia. So it's crazy. You know, I, I went back to Vietnam basically on a dare. I took my son to Thailand and um, he wanted to go surfing and stuff like that. And so anyway, he was there and he was going back to school and I stayed and I met these women, and I was up in Chiang Mai. I don't know if you know Thailand, but Chiang Mai is way north. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful little city. And I was thinking I was going to live there. This is great. I like this. And I had no thoughts of ever going back to Vietnam, even though it wasn't that far away. And I got in this argument with this real super liberal woman who was Canadian, and she told me how wrong the war was and how certain things didn't happen. And I was like, rather than argue with her, you know, we, uh, she goes, um, I didn't. And she goes, we're so close. Why don't you go find out for yourself? And I went, I will. So I got a ticket and I flew. Um, I flew to Laos and then from Laos, I flew into Hanoi. And I remember that first night, I felt like I, this is 2012 or 11 or something like that. And I felt like, wow, I'm here. I'm just no, no backup, no ammo, no gun, no anything. I wonder if they're going to recognize me. It was just thinking like, what if some, oh, I remember him. I shoot him. Get him. You know, all these weird things go through your mind. And drive into into um, Hanoi and on a beautiful brand new four-lane highway. And I stayed at the at the um, Hanoi Hilton, not the one that's famous, but the real Hilton where um, Bush had stayed when he went, when he visited there. And they were so nice to me. And I got the last room and I'm watching, I'm watching television. It was the HBO special when McNamara said like six times how it was a mistake that we went into Vietnam and this didn't happen, that didn't happen, and this was wrong. And I remember throwing the remote control at the television and breaking it. I was so pissed off. And that sort of started my quest to find out. I started what's called the Hidden History Project. And I would go to the archives in, um, uh, in Hanoi where there's there's no internet connection to them there there's just raw stuff and like i showed you this this one picture mm -hmm. which is of um ho chi minh is the really the thin guy in the center and then two in the rest are all americans and then general jap is the guy in the white suit right there and he was working with the oss so there's all of these um things in ho chi minh's archives that that, that he wrote about and that all of the letters I saw that was addressed to Truman that Truman never read, they were going to open up. They wanted to, you know, give us access to, you know, Haiphong. Um, see, the problem was with the French. 
that they had been enslaved by the French. And if Roosevelt would have lived just a few more months and Truman wouldn't have been president, there would have been, Vietnam would have been put in a conservative, like a trusteeship like Hong Kong was for 30 years and then go back to Vietnam. That's what um, uh, Roosevelt wanted to do. He hated the French. He That's why, you know, people forget the Vichy French. I mean, the French rolled over like and capitulated in about, a, was it a week when they rolled into France? Well, what people don't realize that that Hitler now had access to the second largest Navy in the world, which was the French Navy. And they were everywhere, which meant also Vietnam. Vietnam was called Indochina. So yeah. people don't realize Indochina is Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And it's and it, it was all under the Vichy French. And they just opened the doors for the Japanese Imperial Army to come in. And what the, the 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 Japanese had to deal with the French, they said, look, you keep your jobs and that will free up more men. So we go kill Americans. So basically the Vichy French were doing all the support stuff in the airports and everything for the Japanese. You know, people, everybody knows about Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1940. They don't know about December 8th. 250,000 people were killed on December 8th when the, the, the next, when the fleets, you know, went through the whole rest of Asia, killing, you know, Singapore and Indonesia and, you know, the Philippines all, all through there on the 8th. And that, that, Arma that, that, that um, uh, fleet came out of Vietnam. That, that's where it sailed from. And those airplanes. And I, you know, and I started reading how Ho Chi Minh had, the, the Viet Minh had rescued American pilots and he, he walked one all the way back you know, it took a month to get to, to Kunin, China. And what's great is if you get older and you can travel, which I love to do, I would go and trace these places. I would trace where Ho Chi Minh went. And I would trace where uh, the 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 um, OSS were, were in in China, in, in, Kunin, in Kunin, China. And there's a great big thing that says, you know, thanks, America, you know, saved China. You never hear that now. That's all been like, it gets, it gets, covered over with the new communist government doesn't want to hear a, a lot about that stuff, but it's all out there. You know, if you visit these museums and so I started finding out more and more stuff and find, finding out this history that was sort of hidden from us young guys that, that it wasn't that we were fighting the communists. We had inherited this thing because the French said the French name, there's no such thing as a Viet Cong, you know, by the way, that's a bullshit term that was made up by the French. Vietnamese communism, but there's no Viet Cong that, you know, they know, you know, that's, a, that's the front. When you go to Vietnam and you start looking around, you can look at the memorials. There's a memorial to the American, they call it the Americans war. Yeah. And so that was 10 year war. And it's a, it's a topa, like a, you know, shrine, little shrine, blah, blah. blah. And then we go to the French monument and it's this um, big, great big trick because they fought them for 200 years. And of course, then you go, they, then my guy goes, oh, yeah, but that's nothing. And he takes me to the monument to the war with China, which is up on a hill, which is this massive, great big thing. You know, they've been fighting them for 2000 years. They hated the Chinese. Yeah, they still hate the Chinese. You know, they tolerate them. They would get weapons from. But if somebody like I remember reading in the State Department in the 40s, there was or 50s, 60s, there was zero Vietnamese or any anybody of Asian descent that was in the State Department. If somebody would have came over and just counted the number of cannons that were I saw in this one museum for every, you know, ten every uh, hundred years that they fought with the, the Chinese, they would know that we were never going to, that it wasn't backed by China. You know, all of our intel, all of our information was skewed by the French. You know, and you can read all about that. I don't want to go off onto that topic. But that just got me deeper and deeper uh, into I wanted to help. And so um, I I sort of had, it was sort of my uh, giving back. I went into Cambodia and found, I showed you that picture earlier of, I'd found of all of the B-52 strikes. I mean, this is the photograph I'd showed. Yeah, yeah. That. So that let's see, is that uh how do I get it? It's like that. So that's anyway, it's hard to show that. But that's Cambodia. We just we dropped more tonnage on Cambodia than any country, even during World War II. More 
tonnage wise. And and you can and all of this, I got this from Yale University, but the Air Force keeps accurate records. And so all of those are bomb sorties. And and of the I think of the eight eighty five hundred sorties, three thousand of them didn't even have a mission. They just went out and dropped bombs. And so, you know, I'm in Cambodia and I'm I've met a lot of people that lost their grandparents that, you know, B-52s fly so freaking high, you don't know it's there until the bomb blows up. So, you know, we and that just pushed all of these young people into Pol Pot's arms. Pol Pot mm -hmm. was the crazy guy that thought Mao was the greatest thing since sliced bread, but he was going to take it to the next level, take Cambodia back to year zero. So he executed you if you wore glasses, if you had an education. You know, they would, if you... Um, didn't if you broke a needle in stitching if you and it, you couldn't have a family picture i mean they literally just just destroyed that culture and of the seven million people probably killed three million either uh forced labor you know because they they dumped the people out of Phnom Penh and marched them out into the out into the farmland and they became farmers and they would do ridiculous things like i saw this one place where they were trying to build a reservoir uphill, but they were stupid. The people that were running that had no education, even now, today. And I, hopefully this doesn't, Hunsing doesn't, well, he won't care. He's the prime minister of, Cam, of Cambodia. He has a third grade education. You know, people don't, they didn't have a lot of education back then. They, and he fought with Pol Pot and then he went over on the Vietnamese side and came back in and kicked uh, the Khmer Rouge out and then he became the prime minister and that's 30 years ago and he's still the prime minister today but i decided i'm living here i'm going to help these people i've joined the rotary club the vfw it's really neat when you're the vfw and your vfw is the the guys the the name of it is the guys that were on that merchant marine ship that got blasted after at the end of the war you know so we get to we go to the the embassy and hang out with all these cool young you know, soldiers and uh, Marines that are stationed in Phnom Penh and also the uh, finding missing soldiers. I got to work with the, our guys called Stone is the um, code name for it. But the main guy for um, uh, the finding of missing soldiers is even in Vietnam is stationed in Phnom Penh. So I got to know him. And um, I, what I would do is I'd say, look, you know, I know the way these people think. Let's give them something. So let's give them. I did this big painting of the Vietnamese um, when they land when they went through the um, 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 the gates in at the end of the war. And I thought, just give this to them because they give us in, intel on our missing guys. We still have twelve hundred and fifty guys missing, and I found out all of the rigmarole that goes through it to to try to find them. It's amazing. The North Vietnamese have four hundred thousand. And all it says on their birth, on the death certificate location, south. So wow. they got nothing. So I, I even found these, they've, they're called corp, uh, uh, they're, they're psychics. They're, they're corporate, they're corpse finders. They, oh they have God. this psychic thing. And some of it works and stuff like that, but it's like so bizarre. So I, I've helped this uh, woman who has an organization um, to find their, their missing soldiers. And I found 250, 250 graves in Phnom Penh just by talking like this. And, I, and so one of my Khmer friends said, I know where there's this grave site that's Chinese, but it looks like Vietnamese. And we went there and it was all these Vietnamese graves because the Vietnamese lost, they lost 86,000 men fighting the Khmer Rouge after we were gone. We know nothing about all these wars that went on. And when you go there, I mean, if, if I'm there, I'll take you around. I'll take you to see and rip. And there's a museum, the best museum there you've ever seen, because all the tanks and the artillery pieces were left where the last battle was, aimed at each other. They're still there. It's just, it's it's amazing, you know, to find that that kind of that kind of stuff. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. Sorry where, for going on and no, on. No, no. It's this is all like fascinating to hear about. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could also tell us about, you know, some of your art, you know, that some of it you can see behind you. Um, if you could tell oh. us how you, how you got into painting and, and um, you know, some of your work is also Vietnam themed. Well, it was a lot of it was actually I did. I did this. This was this brochure that I made. And these are all 
I can't hold it. How come I can't hold it straight? So these are all paintings that I did. This one, let's see, which one is it? This one. This one won first place in the um, VA's art contest of like 4,500 different VAs across the country. And I, it wasn't even one of my favorites, but I, I guess what it is was the it, it, it captured, you know, what that guy was going through. A moment, yeah. Yeah, a moment. And this is me and the one... This is me and Tubby Clausen. Where there was a these would be photographs, and then I would paint them. So that was that, and then I started painting like my girls, um, like this. Well, it's hard to do this when you're. It's reversed. Yeah, everything's reversed. But um, let's see. I show you some other ones that are. I just did this one the other day, or a, week, a few weeks ago. I like to copy stuff, and so that's a Picasso. And then there's another one of my, I, I saw her in downtown um, Ho Chi Minh City, which is Saigon, for those of you that won't call it Ho Chi Minh City. And I, and we talked about this earlier, but that's always been one of my reliefs, you know, probably read, you know, way before I wrote anything about Vietnam, but I would paint. Well, it was funny when I finished writing that story or the death in the Ansho Valley, I stopped talking about it. There was nothing else to talk about. It was really weird. It was like I got it out of my head and down on paper where it belongs. And so, you know, the way I faced my PTSD was like, they say, bite, bite the dog that bit you, you know, bite the hair on the dog, whatever that saying is. Going back there did more to help my, than a thousand therapists because I got to see the Vietnamese as loving real people with loving families and these people treat by the way if you're a veteran of vietnam war and you go to vietnam you're you're a class higher than any of the tourists they love americans that come back i mean i've seen ho chi minh's body i, I waited in line and i had um, me and another veteran were there and uh, um this little old guy he's old he's my age come up and he had his nva uniform on and all he wanted to do was shake my hand for coming coming here it was just so moving to to it's so it's still real for a lot of these people you know mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. it, it'd be like i'm sure the way the civil war must have been you know in america it, it went on for a long time there was just pain they're still going on well that's still raw there i mean there's still guys are i mean when i first moved to cambodia we were averaging at least one young kid would get killed a week with a bomb, you know, picking up a bomb, you know, something, you know, it was one a week and now it's, it's, I don't hear that much about it. So that's dropped down a lot, but you know, it, in a country where it's just scattered, not only with bombs at the, that the, uh, um, uh, Pol Pot's guys left, but every time, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the, what comes out of a B-52, those little, uh, um, cluster munitions, cluster munitions. They look like balls to play with and they just go everywhere. I've got, you know, you go into Laos and you can go and I went into this museum where um, actually um, President Obama had gone into. And there's all of these, it's it's sad because the, the, there's all of these um, makeshift, like they cut their own foot, like they cut the wood thing for their foot. If they've got their foot blown off, they build their own prosthetic foot or hand or arm, you know, still, I mean, that still goes on. And, you know, there's Laos, especially has still got a lot of, I've got a friend over there. I get every day, I get stuff from him on Facebook and he, uh, we drive motorcycles over there and drive a motorcycle. I mean, if you want to go down the Ho Chi Minh trail, I've got the guy, we could go do a tour and it'll blow your mind. You'll see, cause everything's left the way it was like they, only a couple of years ago, they found a giant Chinese tank that that the that that the Vietnamese were using in Laos, and it got covered over, like the turret was blown off, and then somehow it got covered over dirt. And then they were doing a bridge, and they uncovered this complete tank, you know, <laughs> with the with the rounds in it and everything still ready to fire. I mean, that's still you find that's amazing. You know, that's going to be gone soon. You know, for the scrap guys, will get it, but. It's uh, still there. D, uh, do we have any uh, viewer questions that we can hit up? 
Uh, yeah, I think we have some some viewers got some questions here. Give me one second. Alejandro, again, not to fanboy too much, uh, but would it be okay if I reach out to you to send me to send my book to you and get it autographed? Oh, absolutely. But what I will request is that you send a return envelope paid for. I have people do that, and I end up spending you know six dollars to send a book that I made thirty cents on. <laughs> but here's my my address is one two five um, Surfway. Uh, Unit 339, Monterey, California, 93, hold on, 93 something. Uh, 93, 93940. And my email is Larry at lchambers.com. That's really nice of you, Larry. Um, oh, sure. Scott G, thank you. I wore ten thousands tactical pants doing a job interview, and I ended up getting the job. <laughs> there you go. Good for you. Ringing endorsement. Um, Alejandro, again, thank you. Can you tell the story about the lightning strike? Oh, he did he that. did. Yep. Um, Joe's. By the way, I got a purple heart for that lightning strike, and Miller was the one that pointed out. He said, "Did you ever read your purple heart?" It's for enemies against America. So God is like your enemy. I mean, Miller would always, you know, he was the most educated of all of us. And he would somehow turn something on us with it. <laughs> uh, Joe's, thank you. Was radio direction finding ever a capability you guys used to locate the enemy? No, no. Um, no. Ralph, thank that you. That might have been later. Have you used your recon skills in the finance securities industry? If so, what techniques were useful and what and was it in an urban environment? Urban environment? Well, I, I was a stockbroker in Salt Lake City. But yeah, I definitely, I actually, to brag, I opened up more accounts for EF Hutton in one year. I've set the record. I opened up 300 accounts. And what I would do, and this is when my partner, that started at the same time, he opened up 24. But I opened up so many accounts because what I would do is like, I I'd walk outside and I looked around and I went like, wow, there's the, there's this golden, it, in Salt Lake City, there's the temple, you know, the Mormon temple, but then there's also the, um, 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 not the White House, but the governor, you know, the governor's mansion the, or something it, well yeah for the you know it looks like the white house and i'd look up there and they had a gold it was the top of the building was gold and i went like gold money so i called up the treasurer of the state of utah and i opened up the account my first um order was like eight million um it was no eight eight hundred thousand dollar bonds that i and i wasn't even sure how to buy them but i i would like run into my manager and be like i just got this guy on the phone and wants to invest eight, you know, he's going to roll over his mortgage money and we put together a whole bond portfolio. But so I would, I would do that. I would, I would make sure because we were up at, and there was Merrill Lynch and we'd start at like, um, start at five o'clock in the morning. I would start at four o'clock in the morning. I made sure that nobody was earlier than me. This is in my early years when I was starting because I had more time to get on the phone and call people. So I would go in at four, just as an ego thing. I found out that my, um, I found out that the president of this school, I found out, I'd find out what people would make. And then I would like, like oh, somebody had fired me once. And um, it was another brokerage firm when I, early on when I started. And it was because I couldn't pass that test, that first test. I'd never, never taken a business class. So I didn't know. So I used to, every month I would send him my run and I was, at one time, I was averaging twenty thousand a month, but one month they made forty thousand dollars. This is like nineteen seventy eight when that was a lot of money for a month. And I would I would send in my run and just like just to earn. So I guess I used my ego my ego to to um, to make to make myself be the best me I could be. I never did anything illegal or wrong or anything like that. But I just would push myself push myself because I knew I could take it. You know, like one time 
I gave a talk to, uh, this was at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference. It's the last time they were invited me. I went and I talked to the, all of these women that wanted to write memoirs, and I'd written that Ricardo thing. And, and I was writing every day because I had two kids to feed. And I got up and I said, look, it's unfair because you can't compete against me. I've got to make a living. I'm not doing this because I've got some extra time and I want to like write right, something. Right. And, you know, I'm doing this because I got two kids to feed an ex-wife and probably soon to be another ex-wife. I've got to pay. I got a lot to do. And that's the attitude you've got to take with writing. And I just would send stuff out to anybody. And there's, well, you're not supposed to send it to the editor. I'd call the guy up. He's just a guy or a woman. <laughs> Hi, it's Larry Chambers. I got an article and I figured out I would I would give them the article free and I'd have some corporate, like you have a sponsor. I had sponsors that would pay me. So I didn't need money from the magazine. So pretty soon I'm writing, I was writing three, um, uh, three columns a month and two books a year, three, sometimes three books a year. And I did that for years. So, you know, I guess that's how I used it. I just used my tenacity. And you know what I always would remember is standing there getting that, 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 um, that air metal pinned on my chest. I was so proud of that. And when I do that, I would like get into a, a stance and I could just go all day long. I don't need drugs. I don't need anything. You know, I don't need to drink. I just would just on pure like pride or I don't know the way to explain it, but I didn't use, I didn't sneak around and steal stuff, you know, to get, if that was what the guy was wondering, I didn't do that. I just used tenacity. Tenacity would be the word I would say. Um, one more, Scott G. When you were attending University of Utah, what was your opinion of the economics classes slash professors and any Marxist economics they taught you? Since you planned, I didn't. Go, I didn't you, take any economic classes. I took. I was a ski instructor back then. I I graduated from. I went. I became a ski instructor and I taught at Alta and I got certified at Alf Ingens, which is the hardest ski school in Utah. I mean, there's the best of the best. And so I taught for the University of Utah and I combined that. I sort of made, after I got my first, my bachelor's, because I'd already graduated from junior college before I went in the army. Then I came, got the bachelor's and then I got a master's degree and I used the skiing as a part of, a part of that. Remember, I, I told you I was, dyslexic and ADD. So I avoided anything. Now, now what's to tell something on myself, the first book I read, I probably wasn't, it was Catcher in the Rye. And I was probably 30 years old when I read a whole book, a whole novel all the way through it was the first book I'd ever read because I just avoided reading. I was so bad at it. So dyslexic, I couldn't read. And, you know, so I like cheated most of my way through grammar school. You know that how they were going to put me back in the third grade, but I rem I learned how to forge my mother's signature, and I took the note home and said, "No, he needs he's going to go on." You know, and then I just would cheat. But I nobody knew I was undiagnosed. Nobody knew what that stuff was. Yeah, yeah. Or, or how to how to deal with it. All right, last one, Mike. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for hosting another or, or another extraordinary man who did extraordinary things for our country. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you for yeah. those kind words. Yeah, uh, no, I feel the same way, Larry. I mean, thank you again for doing this. And I, I really hope that folks out there will read his, uh, I mean, you have, as you said, lots of books out there. Some of them are about finance. Uh, tonight, we were talking about Ricondo and the other book Larry wrote, uh, Death in a Shaw Valley, um, are definitely going to be of interest to our viewers. I plowed through this book in a couple of days. I really hope you guys will check it out. Um, Larry, uh, his, his YouTube, his, um, website, you'll be able to find it just down below in the description to this, uh, video or podcast. If you, that's how you're listening to it. Uh, Larry, any final thoughts, anything else that I failed to cover that you want to get out there? Well, yeah, this is, this is for like, like for vets. I mean, one of the things that I've done is I went in Cambodia. I found a woman that had five young daughters and I've supported I, she she didn't understand. I remember telling her, you're not going to understand. I, you know, I, I don't want anything from you. I want to help your family. And I, I, I've sent them through school. I pay for food, lodge for where they live, for meals, for their clothes. I've done that for 10 years. And I've had some people help me, excuse me, along the way. But I sort of, uh, it, 
indirect or directly adopted this Kamai family. And I have to tell you, for a veteran, I have so much meaning in my life because that's what they say. You know what? What makes you for, you know, I'm 75 years old. I'm happy as shit. And I've got two great kids that are adult children, Logan and Kristen, um, in America. But I've got all of these people that I've helped in Cambodia. And I just feel proud of that. You know, not like I owe the Viet what Vietnam did to me. It's so I suggest, you know, going and taking on a mission, something like in 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 um uh, our motto in Rotary is service above self. And that's what it, I get so much more out of helping somebody else than my dumb shit stuff. It's It's been really interesting to see a lot of the Afghanistan veterans helping out Afghan immigrants in the aftermath of the war and, yeah. and helping them come here and settle down. And it's been interesting to see all of that. Yeah, the, like the, the guy that wrote about this early on was, um, uh, you know, the real, it was, he was in a in a concentration camp and he he saw that the that the two there was two groups of people that made it the ones that were super religious so they held on to the religion which i'm not in that group but the other one was they created a sense of meaning that's why you'll always hear you know they're adamant about the holocaust and about what happened they will you they're not going to ever let that die because that gives them purpose and meaning in their life and that's what those guys helping the Afghanistan vets or trying to get somebody, all that stuff that just, that gives you like a goal, a tangible goal to reach and do that's good. And, you know, you feel good about you. I mean, what a great feeling, you know? Larry, thank you again so much, man. And uh, next uh, coming up uh, this week, we're going to have uh, two shows. Actually, we're going to have on the 24th, Alex Hollings, uh, he's a former Marine, and he writes for a, a lot of aviation stuff, a lot of aerospace news. Uh, and then on Friday, uh, episode 88, Mark Denbaugh, uh, who is a, a lawyer who represents uh, one of the uh, inmates down in Guantanamo Bay. Um, so oh. we're going to have him in studio. It's going to be an interesting episode, um, different perspective than what we usually get around here. Uh, so, yeah, Larry, I mean, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, man. And, um, you know, please stay in touch. Let us know if we can help in any way. Yeah, you bet. Well, thank you. It's been fun. Absolutely. All right. We will see all of you guys next Friday. Or actually before Airborne. that. We'll see you with Alex first and then on Friday. Okay.